This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Good, okay. Shkai, everyone, thank you everyone for coming. Maybe some should be uh, our pre Purims here. Shalit uh, Simcha. So here's the story. The, the Galach, you know what a Galach is? Priest. Whatever. He, the monk, the priest, whatever. He, he, he challenged the Yidin to a debate, and uh, if the Rav loses, loses the debate, then they have to leave town, and it was situation was very pressurized and not only that, he said that the debate, because he said this was his answer, he says he knows that the Jews like to manipulate words so the debate is not even going to be with words, the debate is going to be with uh, it's going to be like a pantomime it's going to be like who's going to beat the other one so the Rav said, ah, what should I do? so they got together and they decided we're going to send Mechel Mechel was, wasn't, wasn't the brightest bulb in the box but they figured like this, if Mechel wins Hardly like him. If Mechel wins, he wins. If he loses, they're going to say, hey, you beat Mechel, come on. You beat Mechel, the town Balagol, it's not like you bet, you, you, you challenge the thing. So Mechel takes on the challenge, and he sits there, and there's a big stage, and the king is sitting there, and it's and, and the Galach starts out, and the Galach goes, uh, shows two fingers. That's, that's how the Galach starts, okay? It starts by showing, uh, showing two fingers. I don't know how to present the God. <laughs> and uh, so Mechel, he's not impressed. And, 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 and Mechel goes, you know, this rich shirt, you know, he shows one finger. And the guy was like taken aback. And then, uh, then, then the Galak goes, and the Galak shows, uh, you know, shows all five fingers. It's easy, I'll keep running around the camera, okay. The Galak shows all five fingers, okay? And, and, and Mechel goes, and Mechel shows a fist. Now the Galak's getting very, very nervous. And knows that Mechel, he's not, he's not he, in Ishtar, you know, he wasn't, they're not like, uh, and then uh, the Galak goes, and the Galak, the Galak shows a sword. He takes out his sword. And Mechel, Mechel just, he raises both hands. You know? And you see the Galak is very, very disturbed. And it's happening. And finally we come to the last round. And the Galak goes, and the Galak uh, takes out a whole loaf of bread. A whole loaf of bread. And Mechel goes, and Mechel takes out a whole Tash. And the Galak says, I said, I lost. I lost! I lost! And, and he's very disturbed, and everyone is applauding Mechel. So the, 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 the monks, they call over the Galach, they say to him, what, what happened? Explain to us the, the debate. So the Galach says, I told him that there's more than one God, there's two. And, and, and no, and, and, and Mechel chapped what I meant. He said, no, there's one God. And then I said, you are scattered amongst the world. You're never coming together. And, 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 and Mechel went like this, no, to show like, he's going to gather us together. Then I pulled out a sword, and I said, what about all the people you killed for the blood on your matzahs? And Mechel went like this, he said, the Aser HaSadibris, he says, don't, don't accuse us with Bibles. And at that point, I, I took a loaf of bread, and I said, you see the lechem upon him, the showbread in the Beis Hamikdash used to be a sign of love, in Klal Yisrael and Kaddish Baruch and you don't have that anymore. And he showed me a hamatash. I said, even in Gullus, Shem loves us and we survive. I give up. Mechel just outdid me. So they go with the Mechel. They say, Mechel, yeah. Well, they hid and hid with the Galach said, what went on over there? So Mechel says, I don't know. The Galach started out. We didn't start yet. And he goes, two points for me. I said, no way. One point. That's it. <laughs> and, 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 and then the Galach goes, and, and, and he says, he's going to smack me. I say, you smack me, I punch you. You know what I mean? And, and then, uh, then he goes and he pulls out a sword. So I pulled out a sword. I went, ah, okay, I'm not fighting with a sword. Then what? I don't know. Then he pulls out his bread for lunch. So I pulled out one. My wife gave me a hamatash for lunch. I said, I don't know anything. You know, like, Mechel didn't realize how deep the debate was. He just responded in, he just responded in kind. I, I think Rabbi Sai were all Mechel. Okay. We, we, think we have it all figured out. Puto, uh, um, Puto, Puto, Puto. Uh, Putin and NATO and 
you have it all figured out, you know, how far and negotiations and, and nuclear and, and, and the generals and all the political analysis and the, the military analysis and the effects on the economy and sanctions. We're all, and the Bani is laughing at us. Because we see the world, you know what we see? We see the same thing, Mechelsa. We were not any smarter than Mechelas. So the Veld says that, you know, I said a few times that if you take a look at what's happening now in the world, the world is spinning like a dreidel. Someone said to me, who says it's spinning like a dreidel that goes like this? Maybe it's a gragger that goes like that. This where this person, who doesn't, doesn't have much to do with his time, asked me the question. So I said, okay, let's analyze this a little bit. This will be a step ahead of Mechel. What is the difference between what's represented by a dreidel that spins this way and the gragger that spins this way? It's actually the, the Kedushas Levi talks about this. He says, Hanukkah is the Sarusa de la'ila. Hashem starts first. Hashem spins it first, and we have to pick it up. Purim, we got to start first. We, we, it's a manbara. Right? The dreidel, the handle is on top. The, the gragger, the standard gragger, the, the handle is on the bottom. You, you got you to decide you want to be happy. You got to decide... It's a time for tshuva and a way of simcha. You're going to change your life. The other difference is that uh, when you spin a dreidel, it'll continue to spin for some time. How long it'll spin? Based on the skill of the spinner or the nature of the dreidel. But it'll spin, right? We know what's the rule of, biggest rule of physics is anything that's in motion was put into motion by someone, right? Which is the biggest kasha in evolution. Like who put the planets into motion? Okay. So uh, a dreidel, a gragger... Most graggers don't spin on their own. You got to keep spinning it. You got to keep spinning it. And I think we live in a world where we can't stop. We, we, we can't lose focus in our momentum. And the battle of Purim, which is the battle to see the Rabbi Nishlai and behind the Achashverosh and behind the Esther and behind the politics and behind the horror of horrors of, 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 of what goes on in Achashverosh, murders his wife because of his friend, and he murders and he kills his friend because of his wife. And we look at, and it's all being pulled in Shemayim. And, and to be able to look at the world and look at what's going on in our lives, you have to, you got to keep turning. You got to keep learning about Amuna. Even the Bismarck of Atlantis, you see a lot of Bachram learning, Musr Svarim. You, you, you know, it, there's a stress on Amuna. It's, 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 you got, you got to keep doing it. I think also another difference is, what was the dreidel? Why, why did they have the dreidel, anybody? Where did it come from, the minig of the dreidel? Hanukkah. It was to the Greeks, right? They came to see learning Torah. We're not learning Torah. We're just playing dreidel. So, the dreidel was a defensive mechanism. The gragger is different. The gragger is dealing with the post-trauma, right? Pick up the pieces in your life. And we're not. And I were scared it may happen again. You're right. Pick up the pieces in life, and you have to keep going. It's very interesting. Um, I think the uh, Kedushas Levi said. Somebody said. That every time we bang for Haman, Haman feels it. Haman, which explains in my shul why people bang and bang longer every single year. But they said, you know, it bothers him. So let, let's try to understand that a little. So somebody told me this story, great story, little Talmud tire someplace. And a man walks in. He says, I just retired. I, I was in the printing business. I'd love to help out the yeshiva. I said, sure, I'd have a check to it. No, no, I want to physically help out the yeshiva. You want to wash the things? You know, at the turn of the century, they were lay. There were women in Winsburg that came to Tarbidas and washed the bathrooms and washed the thing. He says, you want to do that? He says, no, I, I, I want to take over the copy room of the yeshiva. Today, teachers in Rebbein were very into copies. They became printers and graphic artists. It's a big part of the teaching of the chinuch. He says, I, I want to run the copy room. So, you know, the, 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 the manal calls up the man's rough. He says, who's this guy? He says, no, he's okay. So fine, he takes over the copy room. And he says, I want to replace the machines. I want it to be... Uh, and he goes, I want to pay. Okay? This is what he says. He says, I want to pay for the, all, the, all the things that people, the Rebbe's print out, the Divrei Taira, which is contrary. I know someone that runs a very, you know, ever see Friday in the shuls, all the Gilyoinus, all the things they have for Shabbos, everyone puts out a Shabbos thing. Mm-hmm. You know? So this, this big business in Manhattan, there's a lot of firm workers, and they noticed that every Friday they ran out of toner, ran out of paper, because everybody was printing for their shul the thing. So when it didn't help, they put into the, they programmed into the computer different things that shuts down the system, like candle lighting, or this week's parasha, gone for the day. So it stopped. But this man was just the opposite. This person was, we have a problem with that a little bit. We don't, uh, guy kept taking his milk from the, you know, guy said he had 
has milk in the refrigerator in the dorm. It kept disappearing. It kept writing private, private, private. So finally, he wrote Chal of Akim, Chal of Akim, but nobody touched it. All right? That's all here. So this guy came in, and he said he's paying for the copies, and he's buying new machines, and he really took care of all the copies. And he did it for like three, four years, and then he said, okay, guys, I'm done. Thanks. Retiring. So they asked him, why? I was just curious what you were up to. And he, he told them that during the war, the Nazis assigned him to slave labor, but he was working in a factory where he had to print out the big Nazi flags, and he printed the, sh- the Strumer. He, he, he was printing the Nazi propaganda, with all the disgusting pictures of Jews turning into vermin and exterminating. All, all the, if he didn't do it, he would be shot. And he said after the war, during the war he didn't have time to think. But after the war, he was so depressed. So depressed about it, you can't imagine. So as Ruff told him, you can sit your whole life depressed, do something about it. He said, what should I do? He said, figure out how many years you worked in that Nazi company. Now that you're retired, join a yeshiva and print the retire. Print the tire for the kids. He says, I figured out, I'm counting copies, he says. I'm counting the years. And it's a myrdika lesson, really, for, for where we are. You know, somebody once said, I saw the pictures of Mr. Clean on, on, the, on the detergent. Somebody said, how do you know Mr. Clean is a man, not a woman? Because only a man cleans with his hands folded like this, right? You know, hello, get to work, you know? Okay. Um, Mashiach, Mashiach will have two important tasks. That's what the Yom Yom says. One is to take Klal Yisrael out of Golis, and the other will be to take Golis out of Klal Yisrael. Okay? And he said the second job will be far more challenging than the first. The, the ability that we have to be able to just shake our fears off and say, okay, I'm starting, and we, we can't. We get stuck in things. The dreidel represents Hanukkah. Hanukkah is Geula. Okay? Basically, English is built. It's back in our hands. Purim Gragar is something else. Purim, Purim, Purim Gragar is survival in Gullis. And we don't say Howl on Purim. Why don't we say Howl on Purim, anybody? Why don't we say Howl on Purim? The Gemara says... Sorry? Megillah is instead. What's one terrorist? Megillah is El Hilula. And? Kati Avdi Hashverish. So we're still Avdi Hashverish, yes? Outside of Eretz Yisrael. Outside of Eretz Yisrael, right? So, but the terrorist that appears a lot is all along the same lines. It's the Megillah. We're, we're outside of Eretz Yisrael. We're, we're still a Vodim of Achashverish. So the dreidel represents, okay, we have a base of Migdash. Purim is saying, no, you don't have a base of Migdash. But your life is rough. You're going to have to keep turning the gragger. You can't let your guard down for a minute. But guess what? You could find simcha in the life that you have now. If you ever had the opportunity of strolling, uh, taking a stroll in the area around the Mir Yeshiva in Beis Yisrael, um, so you may notice you have these stores that pop up around the Mir Yeshiva. And there are only a certain amount of stores, if you realize, that are aligned to Bacharim. There's barbershops. There's cleaners. Right? Shirts. Guys are pressing their shirts. There's uh, Swarm stores. And they all have one thing in common. All these stores sell coffee. Not everyone understood why. And uh, what do they call the sunflower seeds in Hebrew? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy walks in and goes, he wants the, uh, how, Gary, you know, how many do you want? He says, he needs an hour's worth. You know what I mean? <laughs> sell it by the hour, you know. <laughs> yeah. The, the, they all sell Savgunot and Hanukkah and masks on Purim. And Wherever you go, they're selling nuts. There's, there's, it's very big in the shuk, very big in bags of nuts. So, you know, uh, my kids are not in Eretz Yisrael. One is, one daughter and my son-in-law, we couldn't find an apartment for them. And they were living in the furniture. They said, you know what, we want to, we want to go to Eretz Yisrael. I said, that's great, but who exactly is going to support you there? They said, we're going to, we're going to tough it out. We're, we're, we're going to tough it out, okay? So, okay, I'm going to stop you. And they went, and they really toughed it out. They had an apartment that was as big as a closet, half a closet. And um, my daughter, she taught, and, and she braided chalas in a bakery at the beginning. They really, they really, I said, they're not going to last long. But they're, they're there. They're there already many years. If there's will, there's, uh, there's way. So my daughter called me up one night, and she said, I want you to hear what's going on in, in the house. And I hear a lot of laughter and a lot of things. I said, what's happening? She takes the phone out to the yard. Well, what's going on over there? The whole neighborhood sounds like she says, I'll tell you what happened. She says, my, my, my son-in-law, right, he went for a stroll, Bena Starin, to get a coffee. And as Hashgacha would have it, he, he accidentally dropped the coffee into one of those big sacks of nuts. 
So there was a whole garachka now, because I told you about my dropping coffees, right? I know the people heard it a thousand times already, but just to, to, I'm not talking to the camera, talking to the people. I said I had two incidents where I knocked the coffee over in shul. Once I knocked over a coffee on a man, I, I tried to apologize. And he starts screaming at me, and he says, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter said, Shor Shanoga Chesapara goes on a person, also. I wanted to say, if I'm the Shor, then you're the Para. But okay, anyway. Um, the other time was I had a mistake, knocked the coffee over some. I don't do it every day, it was just twice. It happened, okay? And the guy said, the guy said, Oh no, I said, I'll pay, I'll pay for the cleaning bill. He said, It's not that. I said, What's the problem? He says, Now nah, I'm going to be in one of your stories. Looks like he was right. Anyway, so. Uh, so here's the problem. So look, my son-in-law, I guess, is like it says, an Adam is a shtick shver. His son-in-law is like a part of his father-in-law. So he knocked the coffee over into the nuts. And uh, so they realize now that if... Uh, how are you? Good to see you. So they realize now that uh, you will not be, they won't be able to sell it to the general populace. They won't be able to sell it to, to, because it's milchik, right? I'm not sure what the Allah is, if it's in the shop. Anyway. So he, he had to tell the store owner, he says, I knocked the coffee over into your nuts, and he says, I'll, I'll pay for the damages, although he had no clue where that compensation money would come from. So the store owner, he sized up the younger man, and he said, listen, I'll tell you what I'll do for you. I'll sell you the whole sack of nuts for 20 shekel. It was expensive nuts. But he didn't have the 20 shekel on hand, so they made up that. He, he negotiated a payment plan for him, like five shekel a week. And uh, so he had to schlep this huge, big bag of nuts home, like a huge sack. And he lives 20-minute walk. And uh, he, he figured it, it's, it's going to take a long time to use up these nuts. So somebody said to him, I'll tell you what you should do, because the nuts get soggy after a while. So he advised him to toast them. Toast them and shell the nuts. It's going to increase the shell life. So he calls my daughter and he says, listen, I have a surprise. She says, can I have a hint? He says, well, we're going to need a toaster, the one you lent, please get it back from the neighbor, and we need some extra nutcrackers. And he, for what? And he, she sees him schlepping home, and there's four of his chavrusas all helping him carry the bag. Plus there was a hole in the bag, so the nuts were falling all along. So it was like an Yerushalayim, like a version of Hansel and Gretel, a bunch of people were <laughs> following along to see where the nuts are going. And my daughter knew better than to ask for explanations. And uh, so... The, you know, sometimes they give out to the Ingolite uh, bread, milk, baby formula. They don't usually give out sacks of nuts. And uh, the, the whole neighborhood was, was in on this. Uh, there wasn't enough place in the house. So, like they did it in the, in the yard, like in, there's like a yard in between the apartments. So that they, and uh, it, 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 it was like the place is rolling and laughing and they're giggling. And the, 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 the baby, the three-year-old, gets up and he goes, what is going on over here? And my daughter spread parchment paper over the kitchen floor and over the hallway and down the stairs, and all the neighbors are out there cracking nuts. And all the kids, all the Yishalayim the kids, each one is armed with a nutcracker, and they man their position, and they're, they're nutshelling, and they're toasting, and they're bagging, and they're marking it as milchik, you know, the whole operation was underway, and it's schlepping into the night, and they're singing the gunam, and it's like, it doesn't take much to get excited in Yishalayim, right? And this three-year-old, so, um, and my son Allah starts a niggin, and, and, okay. So, enter, not using real names at this point, and on, Baruch and Shana. Baruch and Shana were cousins of America, and they were staying in the, what's the fancy hotel, the Ramada, and they had just returned from a guided tour, and they passed the deer at about 3 a.m., and they, what is going on over there? There was a singing, right, and they wondered which yom was, what, what, what's going on? And they came in, and they also rubbed their eyes like, what is happening over here? And so he invited them to roll up his sleeves and join us. And within seconds, the American cousins were part of the assembly line. And after a few minutes, he says, my son-in-law pulls them to the side. He says, look, I'll be very candid. He said, you're, you're spending $300 a night on the Ramada, whatever it is. Like, you know, you, know, you shouldn't be here uh, toasting nuts. Why don't you go home? So the Baruch, he eyes the family project, and he's red-eyed. And he whispers into my son-in-law's ear. He says, you know, you can buy a hotel room for $300, but we can't buy this. This like, that level of simcha that's going on now, we can't buy it. And, and he said, you know, it kills me that we're growing, my kids are growing up with everything their heart desires. They'll probably never experience the aura in this room. Just to be happy with what's going on in your life, 
Very hard to explain. Look at this Yushalayim that the kids, like 17 kids to a family. Remember, I, I ate once Friday night, and he guy tells me, okay, my kids have to go to sleep, we have to walk out of the room. I'm in the dining room. It was the dining room, it was the bedroom. The, 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 the dining room gets folded up. The dining room table gets folded up. And they spread mattresses on the floor. And then there's like a piano hinge, hinge that comes out, like a, like a board and a piano hinge that's up on four things. And there's, they put a mattress on top of that. Then I heard that they, slip, they sleep in two shifts, the girls and the boys. And the, the father, Yishalayim the Gid, is going around with every single kid. He's saying Kriyash Malamit. He says separately. He doesn't do Tzvila B'tzivah with each one. And they sing a song. And there's, there's such a happiness in this house. Like, you know, oh my, my child, is, he feels like, I think, his self-esteem. And he's in, he sees a therapist three times a week because... You know, we feel that there's a tinge of not depression, but maybe like these kids, like they don't have time for this. And I'm saying it doesn't make sense, right? The, 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 the bracha of life is that to wave the gragger, the bracha of, right, of life is simcha in your own life. I remember uh, I used to visit kids, I used to work with them, tell telling stories that were in hospitals, that were undergoing treatments. What was the Shalayim that a kid that went through Shiva Madir again? And I'm walking in your Shalayim. And you know they have these like baskets where they throw in the the, the instead of they don't have Chinese going around with uh, six tractor trailers of, of shopping wagons. You know, you ever saw them with big big the things the wagons? You don't see them? For Muncie. Oh, you're in Muncie. Oh, okay. Well, in Bar Park you see them. It's like you don't know how many bottles can go into. They have these huge garbage bags and that they pull like on a train for uh, four shopping carts and they go and they give in the bottles. That's their parnasa, you know? You know the guy that came to Ben Gurion Airport? The guy that came to Ben Gurion Airport and he's schlepping like a choo choo train, five refrigerators, all rolling, and he's walking through customs. He goes through the green line. They go, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> What's this? What's the problem? He says, what, What's five refrigerators? He says, Before Pesach. What are you talking about? He says, The one is for Milchik, one is Fleshik, and, and one is for Pesach, and one is Parv. It's, it's all for me. So the guy goes, what's the fifth one for? He goes, for one refrigerator, you're going to make a whole stink? You know, he says, and he continues his lecture. So anyway, so in Yishalayim, they have these like baskets, and you throw these bottles in, you throw, these bo- you throw the bottles in, the empty, the jump bottles, the empty bottles, and it gets, it gets compacted after a while. So I'm walking by, and there's Yishalayim, the kids with the long socks and the knickers, you know them, and they're jumping in it. They're jumping in the jump bottles. And as they're jumping, crunch, 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 and there's a little bit of this red, you know, stuff, sticky stuff, and every once in a while it spritzes out. They're laughing their heads off. You know, their mothers are going to give it to them when they come home. And I'm looking at it, I said, I never saw such joy in my life. And then I see this kid, this kid that, you know, was, that I was visiting all the months, the chemotherapy, he's jumping away in this thing. I said, really? If I had the guts, I would have climbed in and jumped with them. In other words, if I would have jumped in them, this way it was snap, crackle, pop. If I would have jumped in, it would have been crush, right? It would have been end game. But, uh, so I said, where does Simcha come from? Simcha comes from within. It comes from within us. So the Zayir says that Purim is like Yom Kippur, even greater, because Yom Kippur. So with me, Nitla me, right? Yom Kippur means Purim is like Yom Kippur. So what does that mean? How is Purim like Yom Kippur? Anybody, how is Purim like Yom Kippur? Somebody want to suggest? How is Purim like Yom Kippur? What, what, what's the connection? How do you want at the same time now? Yes, Ezra. Because Purim can also be, I think, a day of Kapara too. Day of Kapara, right? Some other is a Kapara in Purim. It's as a day. There is, there is Mechilas of Oynas in Purim. The Zayir says so. Akadekach, that Yom Kippur is like Yom Kippur is like Purim? Right. Akadekach, Shlaim is asking. Yom Kippur is the Raisa. Yom Kippur is the Raisa in Purim, right? It was made for Mishta V'yantef, not the Raisa. Esther want it, right? Esther Brucha Kaidish name, but some cipher says could be the Kermagilla, the Haul Khailak is derisive, but Pashtas is not derisive, good point. So the Shlom Kaddish says something along these lines. He says Yom Kippur is the front door. Yom Kippur, it's very interesting. It says that um, Mardachai wanted Yom Kippur, Mardachai and Esther wanted Yom Kippur to be a uh, Purim to be a Yom Kippur, Isra Malacha. Can't imagine, he couldn't drive around with Shlachmana, so he would not be able to go in groups with the big limousines and the Isra Malacha. And the rabbi said, no, 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 no. Mishta v'yamtiv, yes, but no, no. Mishta, yes, but no, it's a malach. But in the Megillah, it says, anyway, Mishta v'yamtiv, right? So why did they write something in the Megillah? In the Megillah, it says Mishta v'yamtiv. It's not a yamtiv. 
So the Yismach Moshe says, so Marachai said, look, when it comes to Shabbos and Yom Tev, the money you spend on Shabbos and Yom Tev doesn't come off your cheshman that was allotted to you Rosh Hashanah. So Marachai said, okay, so let's say there's no Yisra Malacha, so you should be able to go around with the limousines and the big party buses. Okay, of course, that's very important. But at least the money you didn't spend on Purim, they should get back, just like they get back on Shabbos and Yom Tev. That they agree. That's what the Yismach Moshe says, the Megillah calls it, calls it Yom Tev. Anyway, so the Shlach Kodesh says something along these lines. Yom Kippur is coming into the front door. Coming into the front door. There's a protocol, there's a process how you get in, right? You know the story of the guy, the burglar that went into the Rav's house at 3 a.m. in the morning? He was sure everybody would be sleeping, so he drops through the sky, the sky light, boom, the Rav is there learning. <clears throat> and he's like hanging over there. The Rav looks at him and goes, can I help you? Because the Rav says, nice of you to drop by, you know, but... Uh, so he says, I, 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 I came to ask the Shaila Rav. He says, what's the Shaila? He goes, how do you get out of here? <laughs> okay. So he says, uh, Yom Kippur, we come through the front door. Purim, we crash the party. Okay? Now, my neighborhood in Bar Park, Purim is like wild. Nobody knocks on your door. People just barge in all day. And there's ups and downs to it. There's an insane amount of tzedakah that's given out in Purim. The things get out of hand. Yeah, some of the big guns like leave town for Purim, but they hire security. Most, of it, most people not. It's just, just the way it is on Purim. So I wonder, do I resent when a half-crazed drunk comes dancing on my table in Purim. I never saw the guy before. Comes barging through my front door and starts dancing on my dining room table. Not unheard of. Um, so I said, you know, it depends who the guy is. The guy says, Sudaka, let's go, money, money, money. You know. But if the guy is genuinely happy, it doesn't bother me. If he's genuinely happy, I'm okay with it. I saw in the Swarm store a machser for Purim. I said, oh, you're kidding me? A machser for Purim? You have to be drunk to buy that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to be drunk to buy that one. So I said, you know, maybe, maybe. Maybe because Purim is like Yom Kippur. The three tefillahs, like the tefillahs of Yom Kippur, Musa and Nilo like the Suda. Um, there's, there's on, on Yom Kippur, we say Keser, Yidavan Lusach Svarad. The Kedusha of Keser, the time of the verse is the highest level of Kedusha. On, on Purim has the Kedusha of Keser. Okay? There's no nest of a burning candle. But the amuna that, that's alive in us is the ness. So the Shlach Kaddish says like this, Yom Kippur, the Sat, there's no Rishus to prosecute up there. Purim, he has no Rishus to prosecute down here. What does that mean? Anybody? Yom Kippur says the Shlach, the Sat, there's no Rishus to prosecute up there. Purim, he has no excuse to prosecute down here. How does that work? So part of it is, he says that Leo went to Moshe and said, we got to save Kalal Yisrael. So Moshe said, this is the Medrash says. So, so Moshe said, anyone davening down here, you're Mordechai. Okay, you let him daven down, down there, I'll daven from up there, okay? So apparently there's something about Purim is you have to start. There has to be a will to want to be happy. There has to be a will to... The Rabbi Yankel Galinsky used to say a story that went in, in the Russian Revolution, right before World War I. So I don't know exactly where, what, when, Chechnya, somewhere, uh, this, this guy that was re- rebelling against the Tsar had a major battle and he lost he didn't lose the way Mechel lost. He lost. He lost. There's blood all over the place. And he's running for his life, and he bangs on a Yid's door, and, he, and this Eid Melech HaBoshan comes barging in. He goes, save me! He goes, ah. You know, and, he's, and, 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 and the guys, they're coming for me. And listen, they're banging on the door. Where is he? Where is he? So Mechel, another Mechel, I don't know, maybe the same Mechel, I don't know, but another Mechel thinks quick, and he takes this huge jumbo talus and throws it on top of this Eid Melech HaBoshan, and he says, shake. And the guy goes, oh, shake this way. You know, and the guy's just shaking back and forth, and they walk in, looking around for him. That they somehow they didn't associate him and a talus, you know, and they left. Guy says, "You saved my life. You should know you saved all of Russia." Why do right? I want to save myself? Get out. And a while later, you know, he, he summoned to the king, the new king of that area, and he's there and he's saying vidu. And the guy says, "You saved my life." And he gave him some kind of a card. They said, "Whenever you want, you can come in here." So he'd rather have a card whenever he wants. He shouldn't have to come in there, but that's how it was. Anyway, fast forward. I don't know how many years later. And there's 18 Bachim that are trying to cross this particular border. They're, they're trying to smuggle out. They're caught and they're sentenced to be hung. And someone sent a telegram to Rabbi Chaim Meiser. Rabbi Chaim Meiser said, who, who could save them? Who could save them? They said, there's this guy that has this card. He never used it. So they went to him and he said, Maisi, he came and he wound up saving the 18 Bachim. One of the 18 Bachim that he saved was a stipler. Stipler was amongst those 18 Bachim. He would have been hung, right? He wouldn't have had a stipler. He wouldn't have had a Rabbi Chaim Kriyevsky. Think about this. So Reb Chaim Meiser said that Yankel Galinsky said the guy said he saved Russia. No, he saved Klal Yisrael. In what matzif? Sometimes somebody once told me when I said this year, I feel like that guy with the talus over my head. I said, good, and that'll save Klal Yisrael. Do what you can. 
Purim is for the guy that's, you know, somebody once told me he's confused, he's challenged, he's disoriented, he's mixed up. This, and his final analogy was he feels like he's an Alka Seltzer in Niagara Falls. <laughs> quite, a, quite an analogy, you know. <laughs> so I said, look, you know what? And Purim was made for you. You're, you're a chalik, a lekaim, mal, you're a neshama, is trapped in a guf, your guf is, has a yetzahara, and, and your yetzahara wants you to be sad, your yetzahara grinds up your averois, and, and, and says you're, you're done for, and Chazal say the marshal of the king that jumped into the tannery to save his kala, you know the tannery is terrible, that, that's what it is. Yom Kippur says the shlaw is the king in his glory. Purim is the king of the tannery, the king jumping in. So it's very interesting, Haman's daughter, Haman wanted his daughter to, you know, she is one of the reasons he wanted Vashti dead, because he figured his daughter would be the next queen. And he did everything within his power, and he pushed his daughter in. And she, uh, unlike Esther, she did everything she could to make herself look good. When she stood before Haman, so all of a sudden, she did a terrible body odor, like a very ugh, foul came out of her, bad breath. Her mouth became crooked. And basically, she came in with this big smile, and Achishveri said, Get it out of here! So, what's the fascinating thing about this? Look what a Kaddish Baruch Hu did for us. That the Shechina HaKadosha goes down so low to get involved with a body odor for Haman's daughter. That's, that's the Kala jumping into the tannery, right? Which is a crucial part of saving Kali. So he asks, why is it called Purim? Why is the Yom Tov called Purim? So Purim is the dice. So Bianca Lagolinsky says like this. He says, imagine a Yid is walking in, in, in Eretz Yisrael and an Arab jumps out from behind a, a, a car and he yells, and he has a knife and he's about to stab him and he hit the end of his throat and a dog jumps out from nowhere and bites the attacker on the leg. Right? And he drops the knife and, and he saves the person. So the guy makes the Suda Saida. So what's he going to call the name of this Yom Tif? He's going to call it Yom Hasakin, Day of the Knife. Day of the, knife. Day of the Dog. No, day of the Nest, Day of that soul. So really, what's poor? Poor is the vehicle that Homer was using that with this I could attack Kalei, so why are we calling it Purim? Anybody? So why are we calling it Purim? Why are we calling it Purim? Because that's the whole mess. It's okay, go ahead, That's the whole mess. Pick it, keep going, right? No, meaning like if in the, in the matzah with the dog that you just mentioned, the whole mess is not that the knife didn't stab. The whole mess is that, oh, Paco was amazing. It was Paco. Right, so Ramesha says, in the so Ramesha says, yeah, that's the nice, that this poor... And guess what? We're, every, well, everything says we're done for, and who says? You know? But the whole nest was so by chance, technically. Right. So it was the very hashgacha t- was, 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 was the thing. In other words, was, what you thought, the dice fell in the right place. Yeah, the dice fell in the right place, but not, but not in your way. So, the, so, so Yankov Golinsky says this. Well, imagine the story went differently. Imagine he picks up the knife, and the knife turns into butter in his hands for whatever reason some chemical reaction right, to global warming, but it happened right there and then. The knife turned into butter. So then it makes sense. You would call the Yom Tev Yom HaSakim, Day of the Knife, because it's the knife that's, that saved him. So he says, that the very goyro, the, the very thing that says, nothing is going to come of me in life, that turned it into a bracha. That's why it's called Purim. Because the Yid looks up and says, I'm doomed. Everything here says, I'm doomed. Everything that makes sense says, I'm doomed. Guess what? Bracha. So I read a story today, very interesting. Um, you're not allowed to have robocalls. No robocalls, you get them. Just when you're waiting for an important call and someone picks up. And so National Grid, right, I think National Grid did a robocall and there was a class action suit against, against them. But most of the time you get a robocall, you don't wind up hiring a lawyer to sue the person. But there's a class action, there are things called class action suits where lawyers on behalf of the people, sue the company. The lawyers wind up making millions, and every customer gets five cents. Usually how, that's how it works. So National Grid had to pay out millions and millions of dollars for this uh, avlet that they did, and people got robocalls. I'm wondering, there's people in the Ukraine now that are dying. They're bleeding to death on the floor, right? But here we're being compensated for a robocall. Th- th- does this world make sense? That we, get, we don't get it. It's, it. it's not who we are. We're, we're mechel. We don't see what we're seeing. You know, Putin didn't want the West to come together. And he strengthened the West more than anything else. This, is, this repeats itself in history so many times. Pari didn't want Moshe to be born. He winds up raising power. So that's what Sam says. Haman says, we're scattered. He's right, we're scattered. 
And uh, he was going from the Achdus to bring Klal Yisrael together. He was the one that did it. So Rav Shlomo Shvadron says, he once told somebody that, you know why um, I have a visa to Ganeid? He says, how do you have a visa to Ganeid? So he says, you know, there was a terrible Heaven massacre. It was, uh, it was horrible. I'm not going to enter the story of the Heaven massacre. It's not for before Purim, but it's before 1929. Bachrim was sliced. The British just stood there and did nothing. And they went around in Arab, whatever. The walls of the Chevron, the Yeshiva that was there, and the Yeshiva of Chevron that was there, Mamash and Bayez Shani almost, was dripping with blood. And Ramosh Matcha Epstein, the, the Rashiva of Chevron, he made the decision to go to Eretz Yisrael from Slobodka, and he was, he was ice man. just the, the loss of all these Talmidim. He, Mamash, he didn't come out of his room. And came Purim that year, he didn't come out of his room. So Shom Shadron said, I was a little kid, and I was a Yasin. And I went, and I, and I told the rabbits, and tell them there's a little yasim, I'm an anakal of the Rasham, I want to go into the Rosh Hashiva. So he said, okay, come in. So he says, Rosh Hashiva, can I tell you a story? So he says, yeah. So he says, in, there was a, there were, in my town, I don't know means exactly my town, there was this man, he was the rich guy, everybody trusted him with their money, everybody invested their money with him, he was the guy who invested everything with him, he was, really wasn't an Erlacha guy. All the Almanis, all the assignment, their whole everything. And one day he comes to the rough, crying, screaming, and he says the word, the ship, and he faints. And they wake him up, the ship, and he faints. And they realize, obviously, he put all his money onto this ship, by mistake. He put all his eggs in one basket, and the ship sunk, and now, not, and now he owes the whole town money. He, like, everything switched. And where's going to be the money for all the amounts and the assignment? So the next time he woke up, the rough said to him, how dare you faint? Huh? So he says, you realize, when you're in pain, that a Kaddish Baruch is in pain? How could you cause a Kaddish Baruch such pain? I want you to dance with me right now. That's the story he told Ramat Hamatzah. Ramat Hamatzah said, what do you want? He said, I want you to come into the Purim Sunday. So he kissed him on his forehead, and he, went into, he came into the Purim Sunday. I said, this is, uh, this is who we are, Purim. We should never be tested this way. But this is who we are. So I got a call yesterday from, from a friend of mine, um, Rabbi Blach, who's a rav in Ukraine. And he says to me, you know, he wanted me to make a, a, like a fundraising video for him. And I said, where are you now? He says, he's in the Ukraine. I said, you're where? He said, but I heard you were out. He says, no, now I'm there. I said, you, what? He said, I was in Hungary. And uh, there's a lot of people by the border. So many people by the border. Just, just they're, in a, they're in a camp. He set up a camp for them. He said, I, I can't leave them alone for Shabbos. I had a Kehillah there for 35 years. So he said, I asked Rabban. And they said, okay, you know, I can do it. So he said, and you went back into the Ukraine? And there's millions of refugees running out. He said, but they needed me for Shabbos. Um, okay, he said that he's driving in a cab and, and the guy says, cross the border into the Ukraine. The cab driver thought he's nuts. So he got out and him and his wife pushed a bunch of wagons of food that they had and walked for miles and miles and miles or kilometers across the Hungarian border into the Ukraine. They were picked up by a van. He said he never had such a Shabbos in his life. Besides, he was on the phone all Shabbos arranging buses to get people out of Kiev and arranging security for them, and with the right price, you can get a general, a Ukrainian general, to you know, you know, to agree to send troops to come along and protect them. And, and so I said, you know, I thought I had a good job. It's like I ate chant, I went to sleep afterwards. I had this guest, and I smiled to him. I said, "Well, <laughs> you feel very small, you know." But on the other hand, on the other hand, who who, who are we? It, it takes going into the Ukraine when you're not in the mood of being happy and you get up there and say, I'm going to do my best, that's like going into the Ukraine. That, that, because Baruch Hu says, you got me. I'm there for you, even, if you're, even though you're coming in through the back door. So, end for today. There's this guy, once he comes to Yerushalayim, he comes into Shmuel Salanti in Russia, he had crazy mysterious methods. He made it to Yerushalayim. He says, I was always with Samech, people with music. He says, Rebbe, I'm in my 90s. I want to ask you one thing, don't turn me down. So Shmuel Salanti says, what do you want? He says, I want music by my Levaya. He goes, you want what? I want, I want a band by my Levaya. Something original. He said, you can't really have a band. The Rebbe, I need it! I go, what do you mean you need it? And he didn't stop. He didn't stop. They didn't let him go over to Rosh Mosul. That was his 90s. He said, what should I do for him? But he says he was Mesameach Yidin all over me. I don't know. Can't give him a head. I can't arrange a band for a Levaya. Imagine, you know. Bands for Levayas. Right? You know? And uh, my Kachaya, he died on Purim. Purim afternoon. And they don't let him mess in Yerushalayim overnight. So they had to take him out Purim day. And as they're carrying the aura, there's dancing and music all over the place. 
and a bunch of Litzanim like jumped behind the iron with the music. So he was like, Bam, what are you doing? Rashmus not looked out of his window and said, it's like, he wanted music. All of his life he was Mesameach people with music. That's it. There is nothing that a Kaddish Baruch Hu appreciates more than anything else. I'm talking to myself, Rabbi Sai. When you're in the dumps and you try to be happy, try to be those kids in your Shalayim, and you say, forget about the fact that the world's coming to an end, the sanctions on the economy and the stock market, because you see as much as Mechel sees. Purim is coming. I am the last person to be allowed into the front door. But guess what? Purim, we crash into the back. of and Purim, everybody. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.